everyone. This is Dr. Cheryl Silkman, and welcome to The Love Code. Thank you for joining me today for another opportunity to be inspired, to be transformed, to be uplifted, to be healed. And that really is the purpose of the show. It's all about accessing the power we have within us and bringing more light into our lives and into the world. And as always, I have fantastic conversations with inspiring people. I do want to make a few comments before we begin. First of all, I have a website that if you go to, which is drcherylselman.com, you will be able to access all of the archives of The Love Code and the other show that I do on Progressive Radio Network, which is what women must know. So if you opt in there, I send out the archives to everybody every week. Therefore, you don't miss any of the shows. And it's Dr. Cheryl Selman, and i just like to spell my name for you because you probably won't get it right. It's S-H-E-R-R-I-L-L. Selman is S-E-L-L-M-A-N. So Dr. Cheryl Selman, D-R, CherylSelman.com. So please go there, opt in, because I really want you to be able to access all of these wonderful, inspiring, uplifting healing programs. And, of course, there's lots of other great information that you'll be able to receive from me. And in addition, if you go to my Facebook page, which is What Women Must Know, I post all my shows there as well. Progressive Radio Network has... Um, now has a new service, and it's a voicemail line. If you call in, you can leave a comment for me. You can leave a question for me. You can give me feedback of amazing transformations and healings that's happening as you listen to the show and put into practice some of the tools and strategies uh, that we're sharing on the show. So this is the number. It's 862 800 6805. That's 862 800 6805. 6805. And I look forward to hearing from you. It's always nice to receive some comments from my listening audience out there. I don't get to see you, but I get to hear you. And one other brief announcement, just a little announcement of what's going to be coming. In April, I am going to be facilitating an eight week program for women that is incorporating tools from the Love Code. We are doing a program to experience healing, healing whatever the challenges may be um, hormonally, with health issues, with relationship issues, with emotional issues. And uh, I am coordinating this and creating this with the Dow Institute. We're going to do an amazing eight-week program to experience the heart of healing. So I uh, I will give you more information as the program unfolds, but I just want to kind of titillate you there. So let's uh, let's talk about our wonderful conversation today. I am thrilled to have as my guests Karen Newell and Evan Alexander, Dr. Evan Alexander, who are authors of the wonderful book, Living in a Mindful Universe, A Neurosurgeon's Journey into the Heart of Consciousness. I think it's been a couple of years now that uh, I had these inspiring guests on my show, and I just was thrilled that they are able to come back and uh, be part of the Love Code. I want to share a little bit about what this book is, Living in a Mindful Universe, and what our conversation will be about. So bear with me because um, it's a great introduction. In 2008, Dr. Evan Alexander's brain was severely damaged by a devastating case of bacterial meningitis, and he lapsed into a week-long coma. It was almost certainly a death sentence, but Dr. Alexander miraculously survived and brought back with him an astounding story told in his best-selling book, Proof of Heaven, A Neurosurgeon's Journey into the Afterlife. During seven years in coma, he was plunged into the deepest realms of consciousness and came to understand profound truths about the universe we inhabit. What he learned completely violated everything he knew about the brain, mind, and consciousness and drove him to question some of the most fundamental assumptions of conventional science, leading to a complete flip from his former worldview. The entire scientific community is facing a similar conundrum. How to explain that consciousness is merely a byproduct of the brain when overwhelming evidence suggests otherwise, that consciousness is fundamental in the universe. And on his journey, 
he met Karen Newell, who, uh, well, let me just share a little bit about both of these amazing people. So Evan Alexander was an academic surgeon for over 20, a neurosurgeon for over 25 years, including 15 years at uh, the Brigham and Women's Hospital, Children's Hospital, and Harvard Medical School in Boston. And he has a passion interest in physics and cosmology, and he is the author, as we've said, the New York Times bestselling author, Proof of Heaven, The Map of Heaven and Living in a Mindful Universe. Karen is the co-author of Living in a Mindful Universe, and she has spent a lifetime seeking wisdom through esoteric teachings and first-hand experience exploring realms of consciousness. She empowers others by demonstrating how to connect to inner guidance, achieve inspiration, improve wellness, and develop intuition. She is the co-founder of Sacred Acoustics and co-author with Evan Alexander, Living in a Mindful Universe. These two amazing people are with us today, and we have the most incredible conversation and inspiration and healing ready for you today. So I'm so glad all of you are listening in and it's my great pleasure to welcome Carol Newell and Dr. Evan Alexander to the show. So after that long introduction, (laughs) thank you (laughs) for being with me today. Oh, Cheryl, thanks so much for having us. It's great to be here. Yes, thank you so much. You know, uh, both of you have uh, joined as this amazing team, partners in incredible work, and I just, first of all, just want to acknowledge both of you for the passion, commitment, and service that you are giving to this time in the history of the planet and to the evolution of our consciousness. I, I, I'm very grateful for your work, and I, I just personally want to thank you. I know many people feel the same way. So it's just such an honor to have you both with me on the show and, and able to have this conversation, which will inspire and uplift so many people around the world. So I just want to thank you for the wonderful work you're doing. Well, thank you very much, and it's truly our pleasure to be here, and it's a real honor to be speaking with you this morning and sharing all this. Yes, I agree. Absolutely. Thank you. My pleasure. So so let's start with you, Evan, because for people who haven't really heard your story, and I gave them a little brief taste of it, but uh, it's... It's such an inspirational story. It's almost unbelievable, to be honest. You know, for most people well, hearing it, it, it's like, wow, can, is he making this well, up? That, but you can't. <laughs> well, that, that's a very good point. And, and, of course, that's part of the problem is people in our culture, we're so kind of numb to things that uh, when miracles occur, we often tend to dismiss them out of our kind of cultural blasé. Uh, And that's why it's so important. And I would say the medical community and scientific community have certainly risen up to understand the miraculous nature of my healing. Um, And this does happen uh, fairly commonly in near-death experiences, that we have healing that goes beyond the bounds of uh, any kind of Western medical explanation. Uh, But I think that's why my case uh, garners such attention in the scientific community and in the world at large. And just briefly to summarize why that is the case, um, important to point out that it was in November 2008 that I very rapidly, over three hours or so, went deep into coma on the morning of November 10th, and uh, I was in coma for a week. Uh, it was uh, a coma caused by a very diffuse and aggressive form of bacterial meningoencephalitis. That is, this uh, rare aggressive bacteria, E. coli, was attacking the surface of my brain through all eight lobes, so that My doctors had evidence from my neurologic exams, from the CT and MRI scans, and from the lab values that I had an extremely severe case of uh, bacterial meningoencephalitis. And because of its very nature, that disease attacks the neocortex. That's the human part of the brain. Um, And that's why my experience is so impossible to explain from our conventional uh, kind of neuroscientific idea that the brain creates consciousness and that the neocortex, which is the most recently evolved part of the brain, part that truly makes us human, is absolutely essential for any kind of conscious experience. And yet the gigantic mystery to me on my journey was as my neocortex was being very effectively dismantled by this aggressive uh, infection, my conscious awareness actually expanded tremendously. Uh, and, And that was the deep mystery is how was it 
in, as a card-toting conventional neuroscientist who believes the physical world is all that exists and the brain must therefore create consciousness, how could I possibly explain this? Because what really happened to me was as my brain was taken out of the way, especially the human part of the brain, my actual phenomenal experience and awareness expanded greatly. Uh, that is inexplicable based on our conventional uh, kind of scientific worldview, and that's where uh, I got deeply into uh, exploring all of this. Now, important to point out for your audience that one of the atypical features of my near-death experience, that of course is fully reported in Proof of Heaven, is that I was amnesic. I had no memories. I had no words or language, no knowledge of earth or humans. Nothing remained of what had been Evan Alexander's life experience when I was in this deep coma. Uh, and it turns out that that empty slate or tabula rasa was a very important setting for lessons that I would only uncover in the months and years after the coma. But I had to pay that tremendous price of complete amnesia to start it all out. And when I actually awoke from the seven-day coma, on a Sunday morning in November 2008, um, all I knew was where I'd just been. I did not even recognize loved ones at the bedside, like my mother, my sisters, uh, my sons. Uh, so that was uh, a deep mystery. And, of course, memory came back to me rapidly. Words and language returned literally over hours and days. Childhood memories over a few weeks. In fact, all of my semantic knowledge uh, knowledge of physics, chemistry, biology, cosmology, neuroscience, every bit of that and more came back by about eight weeks post-coma. And that part was a gigantic mystery. And we go into great detail in our book, Living in Mindful Universe, how one of the most powerful pieces of evidence that, uh, uh, you know, these spiritual realms are real and the consciousness is fundamental has, has to do with the fact that memory is not even stored in the physical brain. That's something that neurosurgeons have suspected for a long time uh, based on the fact that all of our neurosurgical resections over the last 100 years have never led to a pattern of a long-term memory loss, uh, although it's clear that if you interfere with the uh, medial temporal lobes, uh, you can damage the ability to convert short-term to long-term memory. But the point is the journey showed me that everything that I thought I knew about the brain and mind and consciousness was false. And then when I started studying other phenomena of non-local consciousness, along with hundreds of scientists around the world, I came to realize our entire model of materialism is completely false. And that's where the neuroscience of consciousness is now leading us into profound new territory about the nature of reality. And that is what the book Living in a Mindful Universe is all about. And the good news for humanity is that it's about a binding together of science and spirituality. Neither one can get out of the current morass without the other. And this synthesis of science and spirituality is exactly what Karen and I are trying to help bring to this world uh, through Living in a Mindful Universe and through all of our presentations and meditation workshops. So it's important for people to understand as part of your story that you are not supposed to live. I, I believe... I don't know why the statistic sticks in my mind from our conversation you know, over a year and a half or two ago that you had 1% chance of surviving. Is that right? Exactly. Well, my doctors, uh, when I first got to the hospital and they found out I had an E. coli meningitis, they predicted I, I had a 10% chance of living through the disease. By the end of a week in coma on a ventilator without showing any signs of neurologic improvement, they dropped that assessment down to 1% to 2% chance of survival. But the worst news for my family was they said there was no chance of recovery. Uh, and that's uh, when you review the medical record, and anybody who wants to review a case report of that medical record can now do so. Because in September of 2018, um, uh, three uh, independent physicians who were not involved in my care wrote a four-page uh, case report summary of my illness. It's reported in the Journal of Nervous and Mental Diseases, and anyone can access that, re that case report for free by going to evanalexander.com and looking uh, at the blog posting I did uh, about a month or so ago on how the, uh, the facts validated my experience. And that blog posting goes into great detail about that article and also has a link directly to the article. But the key things they made apparent in that article, and remember, these are 
This is a peer-reviewed medical article by people not involved in my case who were objectively reviewing it all. Uh, is they first of all note how extraordinary it was that I would have any experience given the damage to my neocortex. They also remark on how unusual any kind of survival and recovery would be in this setting. But they even go further than that, which I thought was a very brave and insightful move because in that case report they actually surmised that it's possible that my extraordinary miraculous recovery was due to the spiritual content of the near-death experience. And that is a critical concept for all of us because every bit of what we're talking about here is healing, becoming whole, becoming more of the higher, the kind of the dream of the higher soul that we came here to be. Uh, and that's why challenges in life like illness and injury should be looked at more as stepping stones, a pathway towards growth and understanding and becoming more of the higher soul that we came to this world to be. Uh, and near-death experiences are kind of the ultimate expression of that in terms of uh, miraculous healing happening because that was the destiny of the soul journey for that particular soul. Well, I, I, I want to talk about that, but I, I first of all just want everyone to understand that with such extensive damage to your brain, not only were you not supposed to survive, they gave you, they you know, reduced the chances to 1-2%, but... Uh, they predicted if you did, you'd be totally brain damaged and would be in a coma and not, you know, be a vegetable basically. And and here right, you and, are. And that's you, a, a, go ahead. That's why they were recommending stopping the antibiotics. My doctors held a conference that seventh day of coma, told my family about those dim uh, prognostic uh, expectations, and recommended stopping the antibiotics. And it was a few hours after that that I started coming back to this world. But, of course, when I did, it was very frightening because my brain was wrecked. As I said, I didn't recognize loved ones. I had almost no language. I was just a complete wreck. But that all very rapidly improved over days. Yeah, so uh, so, so uh, one of my questions is, what is the impact of this validated experience in this report written up, you said, by, two, by four independent uh, uh, physicians, having on your profession, having on the, the, the medical profession in general, the scientific profession, is this creating ripple effects of people really thinking more deeply about the nature of reality and how we treat people? Is this? Do you see... Do you see an impact? For I mean, there's a greater purpose by all this has happened to you, no doubt. We know that. So uh, I'm just curious if you're if you're recognizing how this may be transforming the scientific worldview. Well, right I now. would say that Karen and I see a tremendous amount of scientific support and interest in this evolution. Uh, I mean, it turns out part of the issue is it hinges very deeply. Uh, and the mystery of the measurement paradox in quantum physics, which physicists have struggled with for more than 80 years. But to come to any kind of answers to those kind of really deep questions, we need a much better idea of what consciousness is and what's the relationship between brain and mind. That's why this is also exciting, and I would say absolutely. What Karen and I see in our journeys around the world, uh, and I would say it's probably even a little more apparent in Europe than it is in the United States, but the scientific community is rising up tremendously uh, to embrace this uh, kind of incredible challenge and gift of the understanding of consciousness and the mind-brain relationship in terms of answering some of the deepest questions humanity has ever asked. So, yes, there is a tremendous awakening going on now, uh, and the, the media and the lay press are completely clueless on this. They really don't have a notion of what many in the scientific community recognize is a revolution that will make the Copernican revolution look uh, like mm -hmm. small potatoes by comparison. So, so uh, gosh, you know, <laughs> I have millions of questions, but I want to go back to to your evolution. So you, before this event happened, you were pretty much a, an atheist, is that how would you define yourself? Well, uh, I would not agnostic? say. I'd say I was agnostic. agnostic. I was agnostic. Okay. I had spent most of my life wanting to believe in an afterlife, wanting to believe all those teachings in my Methodist church growing up in North Carolina. But the more I spent decades in neurosurgery, the more I was mystified how any kind of conscious awareness could survive the death of the brain and body. 
And that's why this uh, journey was such a gift. And as we explain in Living in a Mindful Universe, there are very uh, real models of understanding relationship of brain and mind and nature of consciousness and reality. Um, and in, in our Chapter 5 in that book, The Primordial Mind Hypothesis, we string them all together in great detail and talk about how this can work and how the modern scientific community can rise above all this with some kind of understanding. But it does involve putting consciousness as fundamental. And that's where I say that Karen's work is so absolutely essential. As the co-founder of Sacred Acoustics, she is the one who's actually bringing tools to this world in the form of differential frequency brain entrainment and Sacred Acoustics tones for deep meditative practice that are truly revolutionary. But I would like to just jump in here and say that Eben has absolutely transformed from that agnostic to one who absolutely believes that we're all connected. You, you kind of lost that thread. Right. And, of course, the other part of that that I think is so important is in this era when people are debating, you know, is there a God or is God dead or what have you, uh, what I'll point out is this neuroscience of consciousness uh, and philosophy of mind that is now emerging at the leading edges of scientific investigation uh, very strongly supports the reality of a loving personal God. And that uh, m much of that data comes from the near-death experience world, but when you look at it, especially in the setting of broader uh, data and analysis supporting the reality of non-local consciousness and <clears throat> that deep mystery of the measurement paradox in quantum physics, it turns out that this evolving model of reality uh, not only allows for the reality of a spiritual universe and a God and an afterlife and reincarnation, but in many ways insists on it all. So it's a tremendous gift to humanity. Uh, one more thing, and then I, I actually want to um, bring in Karen. Um, Evan, what, when you had that profound transformation of consciousness, when you tapped into another dimension of reality, what, what was the most profound learning and message you brought back from that experience that transformed you and is part of this greater work of transformation that you are now involved with? Well, I'd say the most uh, profound uh, piece of uh, reality that emerges from it all is that the universe is conscious and that every sentient being has, in, in essence, a one-to-one -one relationship with that uh, infinitely creative force for the entire universe. We are co-creators with that God force, and in many ways should not be looked at as separate, even though, of course, uh, you know, our little ego and the little petty concerns of the ego have nothing to do with that higher soul and that primordial mind and that uh, kind of richer version of consciousness. And it's all about a heart consciousness. That is something else. Uh, Karen was a tremendous spiritual mentor to me after we met in November 2011, but one of the most beautiful features uh, of what she showed me about this, this deep reality that I've come to learn through years of experience uh, in meditation is of that binding force of love and how it has infinite power to heal, and it's all really about a heart consciousness. Karen was my main mentor along all of those lines. Yeah, so inspiring. And so, Karen, so tell us, in, in your, I mean, you have been on a profound spiritual journey for many, many decades, I would guess to say, correct? <laughs> or or yes. lifetimes, for sure. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> What what is it that you – how do you define your mission right now in this lifetime? My mission is to teach people that they are integrally connected to that binding force of love. We are actually made from that love. And when I first met Eben, he would talk about this amazing love force that he felt on the other side during his spiritual experience. And other people who've had these kind of experiences talk about it, too. And most of them, when they talk about this love, they say it's so powerful that it only can really be in its full power on the other side, in the spiritual realm. And I have been driven to learn for myself how to bring that love here, here and now, to our world. We talk about this love. People say, you know, there's the Beatles song, 
you know, the Beatles songs that talk about love and love is everything and, oh, we're all formed by love. People say these words all the time. But when you look around the world, I'm not sure that anyone would agree that we're actually using these principles to run our society. And I think this is really missing. And what I really feel is, and I discovered this for myself, is that each of us can act as sort of grounders of this love. And the way we do that is we start to learn how to generate feelings of gratitude, feelings of appreciation and love. It's so easy to think of things that we're grateful for and to ponder and wonder in our minds what we're grateful for. But when it came down to actually feeling the gratitude cultivating it intentionally, I didn't know how to do that, and I was not aware how to do that. And over time, I figured it out, and it really starts with imagining things that you're grateful for. And so my mission really, along with Evans, is to teach people, while the scientific community is catching up and the you know policies and procedures that governments and societies make to put us all you know in groups together, we all as individuals can start to do this ourselves. We don't need to wait for science to catch up with us. And HeartMath Institute is a beautiful scientific resource. They're an uh, a organiz research organization in California. They've been studying the heart for decades. And what they've found is the heart is actually in many ways more powerful than the brain. They each have an electromagnetic field, but the heart's electromagnetic field the, emotional, the magnetic part is 5,000 times bigger than the brain, and the electric part is 60 times greater than the brain. This is a huge magnetic field. And what they found is that we can actually manage the size of that field. It expands and contracts around our bodies based on our emotional state. And so we can manage that by learning how to manage our emotions. What they found is that People who generate feelings of gratitude and what they call coherence, which is basically just that feeling of gratitude and calmness, that you can actually affect the people around you. And so I liken this to the, it's kind of like the golden rule, you know, how you treat others, how you would treat yourself. Well, this is like the ultimate golden rule. As each of us develops that feeling of love inside, we're influencing the people around us without having to say a word in very positive ways. And so this, I believe, is an imperative for each human on the planet to take some time to develop this ability to feel love from within. Now, when people start to do this, what they find is um, as they get more aligned with their inner world, their outer world starts to just get its act together. Everything starts to align without them even kind of trying. It's all about the internal world. The external world is a reflection of that internal world. And I love how your other show is called What Women Want, because I liken this to a masculine-feminine balance. Not necessarily men and women, but that masculine-feminine energy. And masculine energy is very external. And that materialist science that only believes in what we can see with our, or sense with our five physical senses, that's a very masculine way of viewing the world. It's very external. But when you start to pay attention to your internal world, this is a feminine approach to life. And what we really need is the balance of, yes, the external world is important, but that internal world is ever so important, and it's been kind of diminished over time as, as being important. And so this really is my mission, is to teach people how to do this. And it's so important because the the world that we live in is filled with suffering. People, more than ever before, and, and especially in our culture, if we just stay in our culture, which even though our culture is perceived as so advanced, but there's so much suffering. We have so many chronic illnesses. We have so much depression, anxiety, you know, just mental anguish. Um, people are devoid of purpose in their lives. They're working in jobs for the money but sacrificing their lives. I mean, we are kind of heading towards a dead end in terms of understanding who we are. Or, or maybe those experiences when people understand it from your point of view and what you're teaching, they create the the intensity and the tension that ultimately allows them to 
open up and look in other ways at who they are and why they're here and how to, and how to heal and how to find and reconnect with that gratitude and joy and love. It's time we did that. I mean, this right, you know. and that suffering you're speaking of is actually a symptom of that diminishment of the inner world. You know, we grow up and we're told, don't cry. You know, it's not good to show your emotions in public. Just be be strong, you know, and even doctors have to do that when they tell patients, you know, or families that their patient has died, that their loved one has passed on. They have to really harden up those emotions. And so we've all learned how to kind of ignore them. And as you ignore them, you end up suppressing them. And you don't learn how to process those emotions. And so it turns into this anxiety and depression that we see. And we run into people who, uh, people have told me that um, anxiety in children especially has increased, I don't know the exact percentage, but overwhelmingly in the last 10 to 20 years, children did not used to be anxious. And now it's very common for children to have symptoms of anxiety. And so often the solution is for, for medical professionals to give these people substances drugs to help them out. And one thing that we offer is Sacred Acoustics, the company I co-founded, creates a certain kind of sound uh, that's, that's basically brainwave entrainment to help the brain move away from that thinking state into more of a calmer kind of relaxed state. And these sounds are what helped me quiet the mind when I first started to learn how to meditate. But what we found is, is that these sounds have actually been able to help people with the exact issues you're discussing. I know when I first started listening to them, very often I would get emotional as I listened. And I learned that when my emotions were uh, would, would come up during these sound listening sessions, that they were really just triggering something that was already inside of me. And so when it was triggered, it gave me an opportunity to feel the emotion feel how it felt. I didn't necessarily have to put a story to it, or that that often is what we do, you know, the reasons why we feel certain ways. But that's less important than actually allowing yourself to feel and releasing these emotions. And so we were very blessed to have Dr. Anna Yusum, a psychiatrist in New York, who wrote a book called Fulfilled, which Evan actually wrote the foreword for. But she actually last year did a pilot study using our sacred acoustics tones and she found that people reduced anxiety by 25% after only a, a minimum of two weeks of regular listening. That is absolutely a remarkable thing, that all you have to do is listen to these sounds and follow a few protocols, and you will start to have your anxiety reduced. And so we're, we're very hopeful that this will uh, help people in ways that, substances that often have, you know, addictive effects or, or discomforting side effects, that this will really start to make a dent into people's mental health. She actually, that article is with uh, a medical journal right now in the peer reviewing process, but once it is published, I'll be posting that on my website, sacredacoustics.com, and it really is just a matter of people taking a little bit of time each day to focus on their inner world, to learn how to get quiet inside to release stored emotional baggage that we've, we've had in there forever. And Evan is aching to jump in here. Yeah, there was just one thing I wanted to add to this uh, conversation, and it uh, kind of expands on the point you were making <clears throat> earlier about uh, some of the major problems in our society. And that is one general indicator of the health of a society is how long people live. And, of course, for the last century or so, we've seen what are called actuarial survivor survival curves in our culture, uh, leading to longer and longer lifespans, and that's a sign of health. Well, it turns out that for the first time since World War I, a century ago, for the last three years, we've actually had a suppression of those actuarial survival curves. We're going backwards. Uh, we're living a shorter length of time, and that's not because of cancer and heart disease and the usual suspects. It's actually from two major effects that I think are linked to this conversation. One is the opioid crisis. For example, 72,000 people died of opioid overdoses in the year 2017. Uh, the other is a, a major ramp up in suicide. Uh, suicide in our culture increased 26% uh, 
uh, from 1999 till about the year 2016. And uh, these two effects, suicide and opioid crisis and accidental uh, overdose, uh, has been strong enough that it actually is lowering our longevity for how long people live in the United States. And that's a very bad sign. We talk about these things in living in a mindful universe, especially about that opioid epidemic and the suicide uh, crisis, uh, because we believe that those are very important symptoms. And we think that, by and large, they have to do with uh, kind of the failures of our culture to support true spirituality. And when I talk about spirituality, it's not religion, although religion can give people a deep sense of spirituality, but unfortunately, uh, many of our orthodox religious teachings lead to conflict and actually lead away from spirituality. I would say the two main ingredients of spirituality, which we try to uh, uh, strengthen through our workshops and our books and all of our teachings, uh, are, are the quality of sharing one mind. That is really where so much of the uh, evidence from the scientific study of consciousness is going is that we're really sharing that one primordial consciousness and the brain is more of a filter reducing valve that that limits that consciousness and that's the part we can expand on in meditation and the other part of spirituality is a sense of meaning or purpose in our existence and I think when those uh, two features of spirituality are dramatically missing in a society, that's where we start running into that kind of tremendous trouble with suicide, hopelessness, despair, uh, you know, kind of maluse of medications in our attempts to control and modulate those illnesses, uh, and really getting into deep trouble. And, and uh, the sounds, the sacred acoustics are very powerful. I don't have time to go into great detail, but for your listeners, I would just point out that most of the sounds that we've ever heard, and that includes all the chants and the anthems and hymns that people might have used to get into deep transcendental conscious states, those sounds are processed mainly in the very recently evolved neocortex, in the acoustic cortex of the temporal lobes. Whereas the sounds of sacred acoustics, uh, which uh, use a, a, a kind of proprietary blend of monaural and binaural beats, uh, actually have their main impact in the lower brain stem in a circuit that arose more than 300 million years ago. And from my point of view, as we explained in Living in a Mindful Universe, this is one of the reasons that sacred acoustics is so powerful at engendering very deep transcendental states of conscious awareness. So a couple of uh, thoughts come to mind. Number one, when people are dealing with um, suffering in whatever form, it, it's really a call to wake up, to shift consciousness, to find within themselves uh, a deeper connection that can can free them, can reconnect them to who they are so they can transform their life, their health, their situations. I mean, that's, you know, it's, it's taking people to a place where, in a sense, they are, um, the, you know, they've, they've hit the wall, so they have to wake up. And um, the tools that you are talking about that you've created are tools that are just beautiful tools that can facilitate um, this this healing, this awakening to who we are. We've been asleep. If you're in pain and suffering and in situations that are causing you distress, you've been asleep and it's time to wake up because when you wake up, you can heal and, and totally transform your life. So what you're creating is in a sense, uh, a shortcut to help people reconnect. Absolutely, it's a shortcut. I know when I would hear this word meditation, I was very threatened by it because it, I thought I would have to sit in a cave in a robe and, you know, not eat food for seven days or something. And meditation was just had that connotation for me of some kind of ascetic lifestyle. And and so when I would try to do it, it, it was so challenging to just quiet the mind, and I thought it was a waste of time. I told myself I, I'm just not capable of doing this, but it was certain types of sound that really started to help to quiet the brain. And it's so fascinating that if you're a monk in Tibet, you have to practice for 10,000 hours before you're considered an expert. I think that's true if you're a piano player or, you know, as any other kind of um, skill like that, that requires practice, but 10,000 hours, how many of us in the Western world with jobs and children and busy lives have time to, to devote to that? Not many of us do. And so I was thrilled 
when certain sounds provided this very useful shortcut. Now, shortcuts are shortcuts, so you have to be you have to be mindful of that. That it, you know, monks would listen to these types of sounds and say that they could get to, to these states much much easier. And so it really is a useful. We call them training wheels because they're also not necessary for long term. You, they can be used for um, short term. Now, Evan listens to them constantly, almost every day, for a couple hours in the afternoon because he finds such such. Uh, such benefits from going within and continuing that connection with the spiritual realm. But for me, it was really just about how to live my life here, how to find my purpose. I was dying to know my purpose, and I wanted to know so badly. And as I started listening to the sounds, I started to get more and more relaxed. I started to care less about what my purpose was and to become just more aligned with that inner vibration that I started to become more identified with. And then, lo and behold, my purpose became clear. And this is where really finding that space inside to uh, figure out who you truly are, not just your job and your roles and your family and, and all of that, but who that essence is from within. We all can tap into that. It's our birthright. And you mentioned, you know, a lot of how hardships and struggles are often the catalyst for doing something like this. I would say that the hardships and struggles are uh, – indication that something in the internal world is out of balance. And those struggles are always, always engines for growth. Anytime you have a problem in your life, there are opportunities to grow, to change, to evolve beyond the problem. And so any kind of hardships can be seen as really engines for our spiritual growth. And as you say, it's, it's the beginning of awakening to that deeper sense of who we are. Did did these sounds come to you, Karen? Is that how this was created? Did you hear them? No, or? these sounds these sounds are based on uh, something loosely called binaural beats, and it was originally discovered in the 70s by an uh, by an engineer actually. So a very non spiritual source um, discovered these tones, and so it, they were created by an engineer. And what they are designed to do is to bring the brain from the beta state, which when measured with an EEG is roughly 12 to 30 hertz, the electric signal that comes out of the brain. But what we want to do is lower that down to, say, around 4 to 7 hertz, which is the theta range. This is the range that uh, meditators get into. Around 4 hertz is that border between awake and asleep, the hypnagogic state. We're all in that state as we're falling asleep at night, it's when we can kind of, our body starts to get relaxed, but our mind is still aware. This is where the magic can start to happen. And so I discovered these, these kind of binaural beats for myself. And along the way, I met someone named Kevin Cossey, who was also just starting out, but he is an engineer. And he told me he wanted to make his own sound. He is quite an inventive engineer up in uh, New York City. And we embarked on a partnership together to start creating these kinds of binaural beat sorts of sounds. Well, the first thing we did was analyze what other people had done, and we took it all apart and analyzed how it was done, and then we put it back together in ways that we thought made it more powerful for our own personal journeys. And it did. We call it, actually, we call ours neural helix, which is a combination of binaural beats and monaural beats. And when we met Evan, Evan in November 2011, we invited him to listen to our sound, he found them to be so useful that he started using them to revisit his spiritual realms, and he invited me to start teaching others how to use them. And so it's a very long, complicated story, which partially gets told in Living in a Mindful Universe. But we now uh, work together, Evan and I, to teach people, and Kevin and I create the actual tones together. So when people go to the website Sacred Acoustics, and I encourage everyone to go and visit Sacred Acoustics where you have more information and people can download these um, different um, uh, CDs, or uh, I guess they're, are, are they CDs or are they just downloadable? They're, they're available in CD and downloadable MP3 format. A lot of people will say that MP3 is not high enough quality, and we provide them at the highest quality possible and encourage people to keep them at that higher quality to have the highest effectiveness, uh, look on our website, sacredacoustics.com, 
for a, a link to the free download. Enter your email. We'll send you a 20-minute file that be, can be used on a daily basis. There's also another link called Training Series, and this is where I've recorded a bunch of videos, all completely free, teaching people how to use these recordings, even with the free download. You don't necessarily have to buy anything. But all the different options that are offered just have different flavors, different frequency sets. There's also something available on ebonalexander.com, a course that Evan and I created based on the book Living in a Mindful Universe called Your 33-Day Journey into the Heart of Consciousness. And you put your email in there, and we send you an email each day. We include more sacred acoustics uh, recordings with that course. And also, that's all free. And uh, people from around the world take this course, and they leave comments for each other. It's a beautiful community that's developing there at Eben Alexander's site as well. And the only other thing I'd like to add, it's just a word of caution to people, is that these, these tones really do demand significant bandwidth. And the problem is, if you listen to something that's called binaural beats off of YouTube or off uh, out of the iTunes store, et cetera, because of forced compression in those modalities, you're often not getting the power that comes with a full audio file. So one does, does have to be a little cautious, and I wouldn't uh, pass judgment on anything, uh, any binaural beats, if they just came off of YouTube or uh, out of iTunes because they've probably been compressed and therefore inactivated. So. Yeah, not all binaural beats are created equal, so be careful with that. Yeah, so you 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 know there's um <laughs> you know you have to really get the real the real deal in order to receive the benefits. And and, and uh, you know I'm I'm on your uh sacred acoustic site now. So you've got several choices, um foundation series, the heart center, the love body and whole states. Where do people begin if people do people want to uh experience? Yeah, the there's healing? there's also a page on this there's also a page on the site um, called I Want To, and if you go to that page, it's under one of the drop-down menus. I forget which one. Uh, you'll go to that page, and there we'll list, uh, depending on your goal, different places to start because there's many places to start. And it depends really on where you are in your process, if you're experienced with this or not. And so there we give a lot of guidance. And also if people need further guidance after reading all of that information, our contact form comes directly to me, and I'm happy to answer any further questions along those lines. Uh, but Whole States is a wonderful place to start, as well as um, Heart Center. It, it really just depends on, on your personal goals, and uh, that list should get help people out quite a lot. Well, you're pretty thorough, what you're doing in helping to guide people. Um, you know, you have a quote on the site that I really love. It's uh, by uh, Hazra Anayat Khan, who's a, a great Sufi. The knower of the mystery of sound knows the mystery of the whole universe. That's yeah, sound and you know, statement. sound is made of vibration. And yeah. even scientists will tell you that everything is a vibration, including the tables and the ha houses around us. It's all different vibrating strings of energy, and sound is one aspect of that. So, yes, a beautiful quote. Thank you for reading that. It's a beautiful quote. And um, I uh, so, first of all, I want to encourage people to visit Sacred Acoustics because you can download for free a, a short, I think, 20-minute uh, clip of one of the um, recordings. So people can just begin to experience and have a 20-minute meditation. You've got to jump in and do you do something. If you you know do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always gotten. Is one of my favorite sayings. So if people are at a place where they need healing, transformation, answers, just want to reconnect, you have to spend time doing some practice. And this is a beautiful practice for people to do. It's very simple, and you're offering it for free. If people want to go deeper, then Karen has the whole program laid out. Uh, and and uh, Evan, I think that's fantastic what you've created, what you and Karen have created on your site, your 33-day uh, program. So people need to visit Evan Alexander. Let me just ask you this really, to me, profound question. In your spiritual work, in your in your mission in life, 
Uh-huh. What are we on the verge of? What is happening at this point in the history of humanity in your experience? Well, Why from my so point important? of view, this is really uh, kind of where we're supposed to be. Looking back over 5,000 years of uh, kind of human uh, uh, expansion of human understanding of the nature of the universe, um, even though it looks like we have a very troubled world right now with all the political discourse and polarization, economic polarization, horrific damage to our climate through human activity, I mean, uh, we're in a really tough place. And yet, in many ways, I see this awakening that Karen and I talk about in Living in a Mindful Universe uh, as inevitable. And it's a great gift to humanity. It's it's kind of what we owe ourselves for having put up with, uh, you know, a lot of kind of nonsensical thinking over a long period of time. Uh, and so it really is high time for humanity to wake up. I really feel like uh, the alternative to waking up is that we won't even survive. Uh, you know, we're really in deep trouble with uh, with our uh, the climate and, and uh, some of those other issues. And this awakening puts people much more in to- touch with their higher soul, connected with each other, connected with all life, not just on Earth, but sentient life throughout the cosmos. And it's a much more natural uh, kind of flow state uh, of creativity because we're all bound together through love. And the more we can bring compassion, forgiveness, mercy, acceptance, and just unconditional love into our dealings with self and with others, the more this world can wake up and we can truly uh, manifest the world of the dreams of our highest soul. So I'm very optimistic about this. In fact, living in a mindful universe is uh, the attempt by Karen and myself to portray a philosophical position of metaphysical or what's called ontological idealism. But that is the the idea that that mind uh, is completely ruling in this world. And the more we can come to realize that and that we can truly manifest the free will of our higher soul, this world will become a far grander place, more peace, harmony, uh, and uh, just really all of us getting along. It's high time. <laughs> it's definitely high time. Karen, is there any words of wisdom you want to share with us before we Well, I'd just like to remind people. Yeah, I'd like to remind people that each and every one of us as a human has a heart beating inside of our bodies, and this heart is an amazing tool. I encourage people to review the work of HeartMath Institute to realize that this tool is influencing people around you, whether you realize it or not. And so having the ability to manage that electromagnetic field of the heart is really a bonus to the person who's paying attention to it and to the people around them. Absolutely imperative for us to understand how that heart work really works. So this is um, it's such a beautiful conversation. I want to thank both of you, uh, you know, for the for your passion and for your work, for helping us to reconnect to our souls, to understand that we are on a verge of a great awakening, and there are these wonderful gifts that are coming forth, such as the work from Sacred Acoustics, that allow us to shift the frequency to to uh, to access uh, and and align with who we really are, uh, change our frequency, change our field, so to speak. So uh, I do uh, invite people to go and visit Sacred Acoustics. If you get the archive to this show, which I will be sending out if you opt in to Dr. Cheryl Selman or go to my Facebook page, uh, which is what women must know. We, we will have a link to get that free download, or if you just visit directly, sacredacoustics.com, you'll get the download to uh, a 20-minute healing sound frequency recording. And if you visit uh, Dr. Eben Alexander's um, website, which is, uh, it is, uh, let me just see here. It is ebenalexander.com, E-B-E-N, yep. ebenalexander.com. You can access the 33-day course. You know, both of you are so inspiring, and I, I just want to thank you again for being on the show, for reminding us how powerful we are and how important it is for us to wake up and reconnect to 
the truth of who we are to realign with our soul it's really it's really the greatest work that we are doing right now at this point in the evolution of uh, humanity and our consciousness so you two are playing a big big role and uh, i just am very grateful for all that you're doing so thank you again for being on the show well, thank you so much, and thank you, of course, for all the work that you're doing to get this out there. That's a really important role that you're playing. Yeah, we're all in this together. We all have our unique gifts, and every single person's unique gift is also crucial to our very survival. So, yes, thank you. And that's why it's wonderful doing this show, because I get to have inspirational people like yourselves on, um, inspiring me, and uh, as my audience grows around the world, we're we're all doing our part in in uh, remembering who we are and why we're here. So I want to thank both of you again, Dr. Evan Alexander and Karen Newell, for being my guests today. And uh, pick up a copy of Living in a Mindful Universe. It's an inspiring, inspiring book, and will totally change your whole perception of reality and what's going on here and who you are. So uh, until next time, thank you all for joining me. You've been listening to The Love Code. This is Dr. Cheryl Selman. We're here every Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. And also join me on What Women Must Know every Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. So until next time, love, peace, and harmony to all of you. Bye for now. Time has, has